the rate of the SN1 reaction is directly related to the stability of the carbocation intermediate that's formed. And this actually makes a lot of sense because carbocation has to be stable enough to form. So if you, in, over the course of the reaction, are trying to generate a carbocation that's just ridiculously unstable, the reaction is not going to be able to draw enough energy in from its surroundings to actually occur. So the most stable carbocation is the tertiary, and that means that the tertiary carbocations react the fastest in an SN1 mechanism. Sorry, tertiary alkyl halides. The secondary alkyl halides are going to react the next fastest. The SN1 mechanism essentially does not proceed at all for primary or methyl alkyl halides. And this is going to be the same kind of situation as in the SN2 reaction where you learned that the SN2 does not proceed for tertiary alkyl halides. You saw in your textbook that it does kind of a very small, tiny, tiny, tiny bit, and the reaction is extremely slow. Same is going to be the case for SN1 with primaries and methyls, uh, methyl alkyl halides, but um, it's just so incredibly slow that we say that it doesn't react at all. So this is actually kind of nice because when you're looking at an alkyl halide and a nucleophile and you're trying to determine is this going to go by SN1 or is this going to go by SN2, which is the correct mechanism, if it's a tertiary alkyl halide, it's going to go by SN1 and it cannot ever go by SN2. If it's a primary or methyl halide, it's going to go by SN2. SN2, it could never go by SN1. So the secondary alkyl halides are the only ones that can go either SN1 or SN2, and we have some other clues to help us determine which mechanism the alkyl halide will take. The leaving group in SN1 reactions has to follow the same kind of rules as the leaving group for um, SN2s just meaning that it has to be independently stable. So you can't kick off a really, really strong nucleophile, uh, otherwise it's going to come back and try to react with the product of your reaction. And the solvent for SN1 has to be polar, just like with the SN2 reaction, because you're dealing with ionic species in here. In this case, you're dealing with carbo the formation of a carbocation, which is polar substance, and it needs to be protic, unlike the SN2 solvent. A protic solvent, again, is going to be something that has an OH or NH bond in it. The protic solvents help to stabilize the carbocation um, intermediate that's formed in the SN1 reaction. And usually alcohols are used as solvents for the SN1 reactions. So examples would be methanol, like in the example that we saw just um, up above, or ethanol. Those both work as, as good um, solvents. So also, Another clue for helping you determine if it's SN1 or SN2, if you're looking at a reaction, first of all, look at the alkyl halide structure. If it's tertiary, it's going to be SN1. If it's primary or methyl, it's going to be SN2. If it's secondary, it could go by either mechanism, then you want to look at the solvent. Polar protic solvent, SN1. Polar aprotic solvent, SN2. That's the end of this section, so let's write some study questions for this material. I do want you to know the SN1 mechanism.
So your first study question is, what is the SN1 mechanism? I want you to really understand it, so let's add to it, or maybe just don't even write this question. Compare SN1 to SN2 mechanisms. I want you to really understand how those two mechanisms are different. Compare the rate, rate of SN1 reaction for tertiary, secondary, primary, alkyl halides, and methyl halides. And last but not least, what type of solvent is used for SN1? I want you to write a summary for this material, and what I really want you to focus on in your summary is uh, contrasting the steps in the mechanism SN1 to SN2.